Hello, welcome, and thank you for joining us on Disrupt TV. My name is Bala Afshar, Chief Digital Evangelist at Salesforce and your co-host for the next uh, hour. Uh, we welcome you to follow us on Twitter at Disrupt TV Show. Say Ray, send Ray, myself, and our distinguished yes, uh, guest your questions live using hashtag uh, Disrupt TV. Also, please uh, watch our 160 pr prior episodes uh, with SoundCloud, iTunes, YouTube, and Vimeo. It's my pleasure to introduce my co-host. He's the CEO and founder of Constellation Research, best-selling author of Disrupting Digital Business, regular contributor to Harvard Business Review, ZDNet, and other media publications. He's a global sought-after sought keynote speaker and um, one of the top futurists to follow on Twitter at RWANG0. Welcome, Ray Wong, to Disrupt TV. Hey, thanks a lot. I'm here with my awesome co-host, Coast to Coast, across radio stations everywhere, too. Uh, Bala Afshar, he's the Chief Digital Evangelist at Salesforce, but mostly, most importantly, he is an author himself. He's a thought leader, one of the top followers on for CIOs, CMOs, and humans all across the world, especially on Twitter, given his massive following. And he's also on TV. We're seeing him a lot on TV as well. So, but who do we have today? We're here to talk with interesting folks, CEOs, startup executives, smart people, authors, and thought leaders. Who do we have today? We have uh, an incredible executive from one of the largest companies in the world. We have Deepak Padaki, he's executive vice president, group head, strategy, and chief risk officer at Infosys. His responsibilities include long-term strategic planning for the organization and the management of cross-functional strategic in initiatives within Infosys. As the chief risk officer, he's responsible for identifying companies' risk management framework, defining uh, the company's risk management framework, identifying and monitoring the risks to the successful execution of the company's strategy and operations. He oversees Infosys Innovation Fund that invests in startups ecosystem globally. He also oversees the company's M&A function, defining areas of inorganic growth, leading transactions, due diligence, and post-merger integration teams. You can follow Deepak on Twitter at D-P-A-D-A-K-I. Welcome, Deepak, to Disrupt TV. Hey, thanks, Bala. Thanks, Ray. Great to be on the show. Thanks for having me. Thank you, sir. It's the start of a long holiday weekend, so I'm really excited to be here. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know, thank you so much for calling in. I mean, you're in Bangalore. Really appreciate it. You know, you've been at the center of the action at emphasis for a long time, almost from the very, very beginning, and and everyone. Yeah. This IT services market is rapidly evolving. Like we've seen M and A and product engineering mergers with interactive agencies. I mean, the space is so dynamic. Where do you see this market three to five years from now? Are there going to be fewer firms, more specialty firms? Is it going to look different? What's your overall outlook? That's a big question, Ray. <laughs> I know. I know it is. He's a big uh, guy. He totally. Yeah. <laughs> but. Uh, yeah, so let me uh, let me say that this way. Yes, I mean, uh, I've been with Infosys a long time. I started when we were uh, just about 500 people, and today we are 230,000 people across the world in about 80 countries uh, doing stuff with all of the, you know, global 500 uh, kind of enterprises. Uh, but you're right, you know, the, the whole uh, IT services industry, our company included, uh, is going through a very uh, transformative time, if I can define it that way. And uh, I, I see this as uh, four different forces that are acting on the industry today. The first is, uh, you know, clearly we're in a good place because technology spend is on the rise. Uh, uh, it's, it's been so for many, many decades now, uh, but it's getting even more interesting now because technology decisions today in big enterprises are being taken by the business side, not so much just the CIO and CTO like it used to be for, for the last three decades almost. Uh, and that's because there's such a consumerization of technology that's happening, right? So today you have uh, the heads of HR. I mean, I'm, I myself, at Infosys, donning the role of a chief risk officer or a chief strategy officer. I find tech companies coming and pitching to me, not to my CIO, right? Mm. Uh, because they see uh, the, the direct correlation of business with technology. And uh, that's exactly the same situation in at most of our clients, whether it's financial services or uh, anything else. And so this means that companies uh, in the IT services domain have to build a completely new skill set, understanding business, understanding design, understanding, uh, you know, the vertical industries that we service. Uh, and that has been one of the big sources, uh, I mean, big drivers for M&A in the industry, right? 
uh, you find uh, generic IT services companies buying specialty firms. Uh, and so I think, you know, uh, you're right, you know, there's been a lot of M&A activity, uh, but I characterize this m and in, in three buckets. Uh, most of us today are buying what I call as protein. It's, uh, it's little companies with, with capabilities that can give you momentum, right, and keep, your, keep you on the fast growth path. Uh, and then there are a few that are struggling to make it because at the same time as this shift is happening, there's a huge amount of commoditization and cost of talent is going up. And so there are companies that are struggling uh, at this and they're doing the fat acquisitions, which is, you know, bulking up, uh, getting your EPS up, uh, but then it takes time and then you go into this whole cost optimization mode rather than growth mode, right? Uh, that's the second type of m that's happening. Uh, and the third type is you need, uh, you need, you know, you know about this way in your disruptive, you know, uh, kind of uh, narratives that uh, for companies like us, which have been around for a while, you have to keep pushing on EPS as you're trying to do your transformation. And so you need to buy a little carbohydrate every now and then and, and, and give the shareholder something while you're trying to do the transformation in the back end. So all of this is contributing to different kind of m in the industry, right? Uh, and not sure if everyone will survive. It's a very tough uh, space out there. But hey, look, since you've joined Emphasis, there's been a 500x growth in employees. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and revenue. I think we were we were under 5 million when I joined, and today it's like at 12 billion. So. Amazing. Amazing. I'm I'm a part of a company that looks at both organic and inorganic strategy in terms of investing in technology and growing. I think my company has invested over $24 billion in the last two years in acquisitions. Right. So, and, and I've been with the company four years and I think we've acquired 20 some odd companies. So you have to have that uh, hybrid strategy. Um, yeah. We yeah. Have over five, six, 7,000 people a, a year in addition to the acquisition. So I, I, I it's an amazing uh, time and space. And then of course in India, India alone, 10 years from now, it'll be the second largest GDP only to China. Uh, That's right. And, uh, you know, a, a more than a billion unique individuals connected to the Internet that translates to a five point three trillion dollar consumer spending power. Absolutely. That, that's in India. So it, it, it not, it's not just Infosys serving the globe, but where you are is transforming faster than yeah. any other country in the world. <laughs> so so part of that transformation is the service companies evolving into software companies, products and services in this SaaS world. Uh, can you talk a little bit about, as the chief risk officer, your point of view in terms of yeah. every company is a tech company, every company should operate like a software company and data-driven. Company. Right, right. Now, this has been an ongoing debate, I think, uh, for many years now on, uh, you know, should you focus on services or should you get into software? And we had had our brush with this in the last three years, uh, you know, under our ex-CEO who came in from SAP, with a, and we tried to get into software. And I think we've... Uh, uh, if I have to characterize it, uh, there's a, it's a question of timing. Mm. If you look at, uh, you look at the four different types of players in the IT, IT world today, right? So there is a consulting and services company like ourselves. Uh, and then there are the, the, the product players, right? Who used to sell licenses and are trying to move now towards a cloud subscription kind of SaaS operations. Mm. Uh, and then there are, there used to be these large outsourcing kind of companies where you take over all the assets of your client and then you optimize that, right? Uh, whether it's data centers or people and all of that stuff. Uh, and then there are new age players, which are the new SaaS companies like yours, uh, for instance, right? Uh, and then what's happening today is that the technology spend, if, if you just map the growth of these four sectors in the last, uh, you know, take a 15 year view, Mm -hmm. uh, you will see that growth rates for the SaaS companies are on the rise. They are where we were 15 years ago, which is the 30 to 40% growth rates, right? right, right. Uh, and not just that, you know, I was doing an interesting exercise of looking at also as the gross profits of these companies, right? Uh, compared to 15 years ago. And you can see that the SaaS companies are also taking gross profits, which to me is a proxy for the value they're adding to clients and they're able to keep some of those profits. So uh, clearly, uh, even from our perspective, when, you, when we see uh, three to five years out, uh, there's definitely more value being consumed by the software companies. Mm -hmm. And therefore, it's, it's imperative that uh, we also have some kind of a platform product strategy 
today there is still a lot of services money to be made because the platforms are not yet ubiquitous and they're niche and they need integration. They need a lot of uh, services around it, which is good for us as a services company. But uh, if the value is being taken away by the software companies, then uh, we must have a play in that. Uh, so this is a, but this is a difficult transition for services companies because uh, culturally it, uh, it requires a different kind of mindset. It needs a different kind of talent attraction. Yeah. Uh, and we're learning along the way, right? Also, there is this threat of cannibalization. So how do you do this within a company where the software has to, you know, grow, but at the same time, you have to balance it with how much of services revenue is going to cannibalize. So these are some of the experiments we tried over the last three years. I think we've, we've got a certain feel for what it takes. Uh, you have to raise the, the, the cultural aspect of the services organization to start accepting product organizations increase your brand to say you're playing the right places, attract the right talent, uh, and have strong product management skills. The one place uh, that most of us suffer as services companies is in marketing, because if you look at product and SaaS companies today, uh, they're spending loads of money on marketing, which typically a services company does it uh, more word of mouth and in smaller groups. Yeah. Uh, now you need to go out with a very bold marketing strategy, have your ads at all the airports and everywhere else, right? So it's a very different thing uh, altogether. So. Those would be the challenges in my view, but there is no doubt that uh, every services company needs to start thinking about a software strategy. It's true. It reminds me of Peter Drucker's comment, every business must have innovation and marketing. So yeah, no, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> indeed. You're indeed. right, you're right. You're you know, and, and, and that was interesting. At the time Peter Drucker said that, there was no innovation and marketing in a lot of companies. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that, that, now it's yeah, so yeah, common. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that, yeah. That, what foresight, what foresight. What foresight, exactly. Yeah. But Ray, you know, the, 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 the cultural challenge is, uh, how do you take uh, these companies which are 200,000, 300,000, 400,000 sometimes, people strong, which are so process oriented because the, the entire services industry is built on predictable processes and mm -hmm. how you can run this uh, you know, day in and day out with the 80% of the 80-20 rule. And then you want to flip to innovation, which is focused on the 20%, not on the 80%, right? Uh, this is a big mindset change. And uh, how do you do that in every aspect of the company becomes the biggest cultural value. Well, that's why you need a world-class risk officer. So that's, that's <laughs> you can't do any of that without you. So. Yeah, yeah. See, I hold a very strange role. I'm wondering I've got strategy and work. risk, both of it, right? So, <laughs> you know, they, they really wanted to keep you balanced. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Schizophrenic, I say. So, <laughs> let's build on that point that you and Vala were talking about here. And I think it's really important, right? You know, like as AI and automation take shape, what happens to some of the traditional models? Like BPO is, is amazing, right? It's a predictable yeah. process. A predictable process is awesome to automate, right? And, mm -hmm. and over time, you know, cannibalization will happen. But we still need yeah. human, right? We still need people to figure out what is that pro what is the exceptions to the process? How do we train this yeah. system? How do we make it more uh, successful? What can we do to augment it now that we have it automated? So, but but what happens right. to the traditional models for IT services? Do you do do you get into a different business? Do you do design, build, operate instead? Yeah. See, my view on this is uh, you're right. You know, uh, what has been automated today is uh, what we call as uh, deterministic, uh, predictable processes, which is. You know, if you have a person uh, going through a list of actions, a certain input is there. And if you do these actions, you will be, you know, you will, you can predict the output, right? No. Uh, or the output will happen. So this deterministic process is what has been automated today, which is typically in infrastructure management, like, you know, how to reset your password, for instance, or, or BPM, which is our business process outsourcing uh, function. Uh, so much of this is the, was the first wave of automation, which requires actually not very uh, high cognition in the automation engine, right? Because it's really scripting and tooling and processing uh, with, with a little bit of intelligence, but not that much. Uh, I think now we are getting to very interesting problems. Uh, so the first set, when you did this automation, you actually released FTE from your projects and you were able to get some cost benefits because people are getting released and you don't have a, you have a, you have a bot doing the work instead of a person. Uh, but now I think we are getting to more interesting problems in automation. For instance, uh, can a bot actually go and debug code, right? Mm. Where judgment is involved. Uh, and this is what, you know, many of us IT services companies are large pools of people doing this kind of work, which is maintenance of software applications. And here, I think the game is not about replacing people, but it's about increasing productivity. So can you have uh, an automation agent 
that can identify, let's say, go through 10,000 lines of code and say, I think your problem is probably these thousand lines of code, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so this is a productivity game. You're not going to lose the engineer, but you know, how do you now get him to process more number of bugs or fix more number of defects per hour? Uh, because now he does not go through 10,000 lines of code. And then once he fixes it using judgment, then the, the code takes over and does the automation regression testing and whatever else, right? So I think we have, we have to change from, uh, you know, replacing people to increasing productivity of people. Uh, we must have the measures of success correctly defined because otherwise it's going to go into a spiral. Uh, and that's the way I would see uh, this move. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. You, I had the most fun watching the 40 minute debate between Jack Ma and Elon Musk at the ah, AI. You saw that, yes. <laughs> because, you know, Musk's theory is that AI is writing software and eventually, that's right. you know, the, the jobs are going to be displaced in, 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 in an incredible yeah fashion and and jack is you know talking about eq iq and lq and yes exactly <laughs> the juxtaposition of these two incredible minds and their point of view on ai couldn't be further apart but it was it was it's, it's fascinating i highly recommend it yes but I, right. it, it reminds me of uh jeff bezos said often people ask me what i think uh how the future is going to how the future will be 10 years from now and how things are going to change and he said but the more important question is to ask what's not going to change 10 years from now where yeah. you know, cost speed quality personalization those are things people are going to are, want now and they're going to want 10 years from now so you've That's been right. in the process for 30 years you've seen it go from again 5 million to 12 billion what are some of the what are the, some of the things that haven't changed i mean i can tell you the culture of infosys is known around the globe as being very customer centric focusing on defining right. success based on your customer success so I keep, from an outsider, it feels like that hasn't changed. Uh, you've gotten to here, but you still intensely focus on the customer. Are there other things that you have witnessed and recommendations you can make for companies that are going through a hyper growth stage in terms of maintaining a focus on the true North Star that helps you grow and be successful? Yeah, no, I think, uh, uh, Wala, you hit, you hit the nail on the head. I think if I have to think about what hasn't changed, uh, it's the customer centricity. And uh, today, the unit of a uh, unit of uh, resilience in the organization is a project that's uh, sitting in front of the client. And uh, as long as that service mindset stays, then irrespective of whatever else happens, you're always there to service the customer. And I think that's a hallmark of a good services company, right? That you're sitting right there in, in front customer of the client. first and it's spirit to serve, right? I mean, you, you yeah, definitely exactly. And going things. out of the way, you know, irrespective of, uh, you know, what the contract says when the customer's in trouble, are you there with him, right? So I think that's... Uh, that hasn't changed right from the beginning, uh, ever since I was writing software programs uh, you know, way back in 92. Uh, the second thing I would say is uh, uh, values in the company. Uh, it's a very value focused company. Uh, and therefore, when tough decisions have to be taken, they're finally taken on the basis of values. You know, are you being fair? Are you being uh, you know, transparent? Are you putting the customer first? Uh, are you, you know, leading by example and so on? Uh, so that hasn't changed again in you know, 30 odd years. Um, I think uh, the third one I would say is uh, there's been a spirit always of uh, learning and openness. Uh, this again, you know, is a problem for many companies that you get fixed in your ways and you don't want to change. Uh, but right from the beginning, uh, we have always stressed what we call as learnability, which is how can you take what you've learned and apply to a new instance altogether? And so are you going to be open about this, right? Uh, if you're a closed company, then you have this problem. So this is another third hallmark of emphasis, which uh, has lived through the years. And especially in technology, it's required because every two, three years, everything is changing, right? Uh, and so are you, are you going to be on that, on that treadmill again and again? Mm -hmm. And finally, I think, uh, you know, there's a, there comes a point of time when a, a small company has to jump a bridge. So you go from being a big, small company to a small, big company, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, and I think that's, that's the key part, right? When you're going to make that leap and say, you know, now I've become a big company, I'm small, but I'm in the, in the, in the company of much bigger companies, right? Uh, so I think we took a long time to do that because you want, always want to have the soul of a small company. I joke many times with my colleagues that, you know, in the early days when, I, when we used to celebrate a birthday in the team, we used to go out for a drink at night uh, and then the, you know, the, the company wanted to be there with you on your birthday. But then as you start becoming 230,000 people, you can't afford to do that, right? Uh, you know, how do you take 230,000 people out on their birthday? It's not possible. Uh, 
And so, you know, you went through this whole learning where, you know, we used to bring together people, all the people born in April and have a celebration. And then that became too big. And then you had, you know, <laughs> you get these email messages on your birthday saying happy birthday. And so even today, you go out with your team at the night, you know, at the end of the day and have a beer because, uh, you know, you, the team and the smallness of it really works, right? Yeah. So I think these are the cultural things that don't, uh, that haven't changed over the years. Right. So I, can tell from the, I can tell from the way you speak about your company, you love the company, and it's nice to see a person go from, you know, 500 people to 220,000 and still maintain that enthusiasm and passion. That, that speaks volumes about it. <laughs> really well, this yes. is awesome, man. So, hey, Deepak, thanks for being here. Thanks for sharing your experiences from almost 30 years at Emphasis. Deepak Padaki, strategy, M&A, and chief risk officer at Emphasis. You can follow him on Twitter at D. P-A-D-A-K-I. Thanks a lot, Deepak. Thank you, Thanks, Ray. Thanks, Vala. Great to be on. Excellent. Thank you so much. Happy Labor Day. Those were gold nuggets of wisdom. You got to watch that 20-minute segment again. He said yeah, we're going to watch this again and again. Uh, but, but who do we have next? We got more <laughs> gold nuggets of wisdom coming. Yeah. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Well, our, our next guest is uh, Dr. Tina Moen, Senior Deputy Chief Health Officer and Chief Pharmacy Officer at IBM Watson Health. Dr. Moen has spent the last 17 years in the healthcare information technology industry, providing clinical leadership to colleagues and clients in the US and abroad. Uh, Dr. Moen serves as Senior Deputy Chief Health Officer at uh, IBM Watson Health. In her role, she uh, crosses business providing clinical leadership and support for strategy and sales. Additionally, Dr. Moen's efforts to educate business on the published evidence that supports Watson Health Solutions, an incredibly uh, innovative area uh, uh, is, is Watson AI. You can follow Dr. Moen on Twitter at T-I-N-A-M-O-E-N-P-H-A-R-N-D. Welcome, uh, Dr. Moen, to Disrupt TV. Thank you. Thanks for having me, guys. This is an exciting way to spend Friday morning. <laughs> <laughs> hey, thanks a lot. No, this is wonderful. And more importantly, I mean, you've been in this space for quite some time. You've been at the intersection of healthcare, pharmacy, uh, informatics. Uh, where do you think we are right now? As we were talking slightly about AI and really about where AI is in healthcare uh, to, the, to today's state. Yeah, it's interesting. It's um... I, I need to I need to spice up my my intro there a little bit. <laughs> um, this, maybe Ray, you could always do it. That's great. Um, the but the interesting thing about where we are is that we're we're we've made a lot of progress, but we're still at the beginning. Yeah. So tons of um, time and effort has been spent by companies like IBM and others um, building out the um, training, if you will, to uh, have AI understand the language of healthcare, which, as we all know, is very complicated yeah. and um, and intertwined in many really sort of sticky ways. Uh, so, so a lot of work, years of work have been done um, preparing to then start really applying AI to healthcare problems. So, so lots of work has been done, long ways in, but also really early on the actual seeing it out in the market um, and identifying additional areas that would be um, ripe for uh, applying AI to solve, help people solve problems. I mean, this stuff is hard, right? I mean, it's, it's, yeah. is, it the, is it getting the data there or is it making sure it's in the right level of precision? I mean, this is healthcare. This isn't like, you know, 9% accuracy in manufacturing. You're like, oh, that's pretty cool. I mean, 9% accuracy in healthcare, you're like, eh, no, 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 no. Nobody wants to be on the receiving end of that, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, not at all. We had a, we had a data scientist uh, on the show last week and she placed a strong emphasis on just the process of cleaning the data before you can apply the algorithms. And I think it was interesting to, you know, to understand that there's a lot of effort that goes into creating the systems that allow us to have benefits of this augmented intelligence. Exactly. So, yeah, so it is, it is, um, you know, how, what the state of the data is hugely important into how, how beneficial the AI will be. Um, we all know that data sort of inherently is a little bit dirty. Um, so you, to raise point, you apply that phenomenon to healthcare data and there starts to be more risk and more concern and more um, hesitation. So uh, there's that, that part of the data conundrum. And then there's also this um, added element of uh, what kind of data are we not capturing very well as a society that really does indicate, have, have influence over um, what might be going on with our health individually or as a population. 
are these like nonverbal cues or are you talking about something different? This is kind of interesting. Yeah, I'm talking about stuff like, so, so when we talk about healthcare data, um, we often think about what our, you know, our healthcare team writes down in the EMR, um, hmm. claims data has a ton of rich, uh, valuable yeah. insight there. The com combination of those two things is really powerful. Um, but that's such a small percentage of what actually reflects the three of us and, and everybody else out there and what goes into making us healthy. healthy. So things like um, our, our genetics, of course, and we're getting more and more data around that all the time, which is great. Um, but also uh, where we live, our, the social determinants of health kind of thing, the, ah. um, our, our zip codes, our, our friend networks, the people you right. hang out with um, influence your health. If you have friends that uh, like to hike, I live in Colorado, so we do a lot of hiking and outdoor stuff here, eat kale a lot. <laughs> Um, if, uh, you know, if, if you live somewhere else that maybe doesn't have uh, that sort of, you know, the, the right kind of climate or things like that, or, or your friends prefer, um, you know, they're more foodies and they like rich Italian food, which I love as well, video games, exactly, that impacts our health as well. So that kind of data, but, but really big piece, um, and we're getting more and more um, insight into this all the time, but is those personal choices that we all make. So many people wear Fitbits, many people track their activity. Um, many people track what they're eating. So your activity and what you're eating, huge implications for your health. Um, but historically, we haven't done a very good job of um, pulling that kind of data into decision making for clinicians. I, I know when I was practicing and taking care of people, um, I had to trust what the person was telling me um, about their diet if we were perhaps trying to help them lose weight or dealing with diabetes. And, and uh, it's easy to forget the, the cupcake you might have had last night when you're sitting in front of <laughs> what, what cupcake? How do you know? <laughs> so, so those kinds of data and adding all of those together, I think that's the real promise of what AI can do for us and um, make sense of the traditional healthcare data, but then also some of these less traditional things. That's amazing. You know, I, I could argue that, um, that in terms of society's awareness of AI, not just the technologists that are tuning into our show and our, our guests, um, IBM Watson is what really brought the power of AI uh, visibility to the world with Jeopardy. Right. And um, when I think about, you know, uh, come January of next year, the youngest person from the 20th century is no longer a teenager, they're 20 years or older. Wow. So, so they're all digital natives. Yes. Um, you know, they're born after Google and Facebook and, you know, and Uber and Airbnb and Watson. And uh, so they're all digital natives. Everyone's sharing information, this hyper-connected knowledge sharing. So it seems like if a third of the world is, is going to be 18 years or younger, according to the World Economic Forum this year, there is this, it, it seems like it's right time for artificial intelligence because we're, we're consuming and delivering so much data. Um, and quantifiable data, personal data, where we can improve uh, the blind spots we may have in healthcare. So what are your thoughts about this connectivity and the fact that, and then, and then the balance of privacy and ethics when it comes to using AI in healthcare? Yeah, interesting. I mean, there's, you, you mentioned the, the Elon Musk debate and, and you, can yeah, get, yeah, this so topic, you can get five people to, to have different uh, perspectives, but um, the generational shift is certainly going to make a difference. I've, I've got two 20 plus year olds in my home too. And, and the way they understand uh, tech is very different than the way I do, despite where I work. Um, so, so that's very real. And I think that'll play a big role in the evolution of AI in healthcare. Um, but we also have to think about the, you know, the, the folks like myself who are practicing in healthcare today, um, who may be a little bit more hesitant and how do we help them understand what AI is doing, where it's getting, where it's getting its information from, how it's making its correlations, you know, how it's been trained, right. um, that the, what it's doing with the uh, dynamic that we discussed earlier around um, less than perfect data sets. Right. Um, it, it's, it's organizations like ours jobs to um, be very transparent about right. that stuff so that clinicians and decision makers who might use this um, what we call augmented intelligence to help them make a decision, whether it's for a, an individual patient or a population or organization, um, help them be comfortable that this, right. um, this tool is, is, if you will, thinking the way we might think. And Dr. Moore, do you think there's enough diversity in healthcare technology sector where these algorithms that are being developed are not just, you know, 10 white guys in a lab building 
you know, <laughs> building, writing code. <laughs> right. It, it's a huge issue. So, so diversity, and I know IBM's done a lot of work around this and Absolutely. as well, but Absolutely. of not, not baking bias in, right? right. So that's the, that's the beauty of what AI could potentially offer to us. Um, but you have to be very mindful of that right. as you're building it, of, of um, making sure that you're pulling in robust enough data sets. And do I think every data set is robust enough? No. Yeah. I don't, um, depending, especially depending on what kind of question you're asking, you know, so pediatric questions are harder. We have less, we have less data there or um, in the US, um, the uninsured population, we have less data there. Right. So we have to you have to be really mindful of, um, again, being transparent about what data is being used so that yep. the end user can make a decision about, do I trust this enough to help make this particular decision? Um, and then also be very um, intentional right. in the training phase uh, to, to expose the AI to as much diversity in, in every um, flavor of diversity, whether That's it's right. gender, race, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, that, so that, that, again, that uh, inherent bias isn't baked in from the start. Well, IBM is a leader in that space, so we're in good hands. Thank you. It's a, it's a, you know, it's interesting. It's a it's such a labor of love for so many people, um, and, and we have such diversity in our organization that it's sort of walking the walk, um, right. as you talk the talk as well. Yeah, absolutely. So hey, as we're talking about that, it got me to thinking. You know, I mean, there are a lot of barriers to people accepting that data, right? Mm -hmm. And what do you do to help people feel better with it? Like. Do you get them to train on it? Do you get them to, you know, do you know, work with it so they build it and test it? Do you, do you do something different? Because that's a big barrier. Because I mean, we're talking about life and death decisions here. It's not like, oh, okay, if I make a mistake, big deal. It's a simulation. I mean, people like are trained to make sure one, they do no harm. Two, right? You know, they definitely improve people's lives. So, right. so, what have you seen that's been working? Yeah, it's an interesting question. I think it's a, I think it's a multifactorial um, approach. Um, partly because of the generational issue that we talked about earlier. So, so absolutely getting, um, getting people like myself into organizations like this, who sort of have walked the walk of the people who will be using it um, so that we could say, oh, that's, not, that's actually not how that question comes up or that's not quite how that, what that question is actually intending or meaning. So um, as we're building things internally, making sure we have um, people who used to do the thing that uh, we may be trying to build a solution around. So that's one. Um, certainly partnering with people. Uh, um, no, no one company is going to um, revolutionize and, and really impact uh, the overall um, uh, direction that healthcare has been taking by themselves. So we partner with great organizations um, who bring something different to the table, whether they be provider organizations or, or um, you know, other tech companies or things like that. Having a very diverse team approaching um, uh, approaching how we build things, how we roll it out, that helps, um, but also gets a little bit of that, um, particularly if you're, use, if you're partnering with a organization who will eventually be an end user, um, yep. you get some of that, that fear away because they are learning it in the testing environment, um, and then they can start uh, sort of evangelizing it for themselves. I, you know, I, I, I helped um, create this thing. Um, I, now I understand it and trust it, and so when you hear from someone that's like you, um, there's this uh, additional level of, um, of trust and then just being super transparent, you know, having, having folks in our organization when they're going out talking to um, people who are interested in things like this. And when they ask a hard question, open up, open up the, you know, the, the kimono, if you will, and, and demonstrate uh, how the decisions and, and insights are being surfaced through the AI so that there isn't, it's that idea of a black box versus a glass box, right? Stay away from this, um, it's magic behind there. It isn't magic. There's there's rules and, <laughs> and um, no black box. No black box. Right. We're, we're live here with Tina Moen, senior deputy chief health officer and chief pharmacy officer at IBM Watson Health. We got more questions for her. Uh, Bala, please keep going. Yeah, you know it's it's uh, the last 26 years. No other company in the world has been issued more patents, U.S. patents, than IBM. Almost 10,000 patents last year. Yeah. So in terms of innovation, leading edge, first industry. No, no company touches IBM. So this incredible amount of innovation. But can can you give us an example of some uh, ways AI is being applied to to healthcare challenges? Maybe one or two examples. Sure. There. Yeah. So so I'm glad you mentioned that. I, I before coming to IBM, I didn't. I had no idea that IBM had been the patent leader for um, 26 years. We have a very robust research organization, and it's a passion for the company. Yeah. Um, a lot of really cool stuff comes out of our research organization. 
some examples uh, related to healthcare, um, doing some really interesting work around um, uh, speech assessment. So training, um, training AI to understand uh, the cadence at which we speak, the word choices we use, all of those things, and then applying that to things in healthcare that have a speech implication. So things like dementia. Um, so can we use AI um, uh, to uh, have sort of this low cost and, and very um, unintrusive way to monitor elderly people and their, and their speech, uh, which would then help a, a care, caregiver or a care team um, perhaps see a little further ahead of time where their um, cognitive state might be or if it's declining, if there's something we need to you know, change in their daily life. Another example of this speech is speech analysis is in um, applying it to, uh, again, people's cadence of speech and their word choices to folks who may be at risk of um, a, a worsening uh, episode around um, psychosis, schizophrenia, things like that. Mm -hmm. So all of these areas that clinicians do today, um, uh, but we're not with clients 24 seven or patients 24 seven, thankfully, right? Nobody wants their doctor hanging out with them all the time. Um, but can we put something in your hand when you are out in your regular life, which is 90% of your life, um, that can help assess where you are and identify ahead of time sooner than uh, maybe you might if you have to go to the doctor next Tuesday uh, but what if what if today you're you're starting to show some signs of um, more symptoms and things like that? Now, now we got some interesting questions from the chat uh, from Charles. How can you answer uh, or how can you ensure that the user, the patient, can get access to this data and they can take it with them? Uh, because a lot of folks are wondering uh, how how they uh, that patient data ownership piece has become a big question. Portability and ownership of data is that the question, right? I believe so, yes. Yeah, that's a good question. So, so when we think about uh, the work that we're doing, we really put it into three categories. This idea of management decision support, this idea of clinician decision, decision support, and then consumer um, decision support. So great question. I think that's a, um, a question that the um, industry as a whole has to sort of um, solve for, because certainly who owns the data today um, right. is certainly not uh, Watson Health. Sometimes it's a hospital organization. Sometimes it's a, a different, um, you know, a tech company that might be uh, providing a solution. So even the PBM might even own it. So exactly now, now the this idea of how we expose these insights to um, to patients is a really interesting one, and I think a, an important one. We all we all want to understand what our physician or care team might be seeing um, that's leading him or her to make recommendations for us. And that can be done a little more easily than, than actually making sure that per, the patient has the data. Yeah. That's a really big, um, hairy problem that definitely needs to right. be solved. Um, but as far as you know, what, what a clinician or a decision maker for on your behalf might be seeing, um, that's easy enough to you know, engage people in with the tool. So we have some examples of folks using our Watson for Oncology solution um, that turn the screen around and say, here's what I'm seeing. Here's, here's, right. Here's what I'm recommending. Here's why I'm recommending it. Here's you know the evidence level that has been identified by Watson, and really having a um, very informed uh, patient caregiver uh, conversation yeah. with the AI sitting right there, so that the patient um, again doesn't feel like this is a black box. Absolutely. Now, one of the things that IBM is also doing some breakthrough pioneering work in terms of the distributed ledger and a uh, combination of blockchain and and. Uh, to address uh, security scale, portability and privacy and sharing of data across multiple stakeholders, including the patient. So I'm not a futurist, but Ray, I would say if we, I'm a betting man. In, in, in less than five years, this thing will be solved and it will have something to do with uh, impact of uh, blockchain in, in healthcare. But again, I, you're the futurist, so. <laughs> I, I don't know, you've, you've heard it here first from uh, Vala. Hey, now, you know, real quick, part of, part of the show is really about learning from leaders and really learning from, from their experiences. I mean, you've gone from clinical pharmacist, right, mm -hmm. to looking at, you know, sitting through this progression of healthcare, healthcare informatics to AI. Uh, talk a little bit about how you got there and, and if there's anyone you want to thank along the way. Uh, <laughs> How much time do we have? No. <laughs> <laughs> One minute. <laughs> okay. So I always, I'm, I'm fascinated by uh, lots of people's career paths. I think um, certainly my, my father has been my biggest mentor, was my biggest mentor um, for many years. And he always taught me um, to, to not say no to very many opportunities. 
And so as my career um, you know, progressed and people would um, approach me about, hey, would you, have you ever thought about this? And my initial gut was, response was no. I'm not qualified for that. I'm not ready for that. I don't even know what that is. Um, I learned to not have that sort of um, approach to life. Um, and, and that's really just led the next opportunity to the next opportunity. It's been, I, I did not expect to be in this role um, when I graduated from pharmacy school, but lots of great mentors along the way. I'm also an observer of um, human behavior. So I, um, I like to learn um, about who I want to be and who I don't want to be by, um, by seeing examples on both sides of that <laughs> coin. Awesome. Uh, <laughs> it's been an interesting way for sure. Well, wonderful. This has been awesome. We're getting insights on AI, healthcare, what's happening next. Here with Dr. Tina Mullen, Senior Deputy Chief Health Officer and Chief Pharmacy Officer for IBM Watson Health. You can follow her on Twitter at Tina Mullen PharmD. So, hey, thanks a lot for being on the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Guys. You're terrific. Uh, have a great weekend. That was amazing career advice. Often, when you're a high potential individual and you have a reputation of getting things done, you will get offered to do things that you don't have experience and you may not be comfortable doing, do it anyway, because it's the fastest way to grow yourself and the organization you're a part of. And, and that's what our next guest, no, I was kidding. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Someone who I've been observing for years, who decided that he was going to take his thought leadership and become, and really transform himself to a digital social executive. And I saw someone with a small network grow into an incredible voice in the industry in such short amount of time. And that just speaks to his generosity and intellect. David Chow, Vice President, Principal Analyst at Constellation Research, covering the intersection of healthcare systems, uh, stringent processes and regulations, and the transformational power of technology. With uh, 20 years of experience, so he started when he was 11, as a senior IT executive across <laughs> various healthcare systems. He hasn't aged in 10 years. Um, David brings the CIO's practicality to his advisory practice on emerging technologies and disruptive innovation. His expertise is helping health system transition towards becoming a digital enterprise and healthcare in a healthcare setting. He's worked on building digital hospitals from the ground up, turning around financial distress, distressed health systems to profitable profitability with use of technology. So he's a practitioner. It, it's not you know, someone who reads and shares. <laughs> He's actually built world-class healthcare organization. He's an incredible follow on Twitter, a must follow. In fact, he was named by numerous publications as one of the most social CIOs in the world. Uh, he's a great follow on Twitter at DCHOU1107. Welcome back, David Chow, to Disrupt TV. Wow, great bio, Falk. Did you make this up for me? This is awesome. I feel like the cleanup person coming in after two superstars. It's like the bench time for me, right? With, uh, with uh, Tina, Dr. Tina Mullen and, and uh, Deepak, you do have big shoes. <laughs> we're sure you're going to be doing an amazing job. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're looking at David with us. So, so David, what's going on in healthcare? What, what are the top three, five, three to five focus areas that healthcare executives are like, pulling their hair out, going crazy, so. Yeah, we're, we're actually in this, I'll call it the post uh, EMR period, right? Everyone invested billions of dollars the last seven to eight years on this electronic medical record system. So the, the industry went fully electronic where it was primarily paper. So now I wanna say at least 97% of the organization have the means to transfer their information digitally in some sort of media fashion. Now, what does that mean? They spend so much money now. They need to figure out how to be more cost effective. The money well is starting to slim down. So a lot of folks are now, now looking at the back office transformation. I'll call that lean transformation 2.0. They're looking at ways to optimize their ERP systems uh, because everyone's focusing has been on the EMR. Now they got to get the ERP. It's been neglected for so long. That's coming up. Second is security. There's not a day that you're not looking and reading about some sort of exposure from a health system that's getting breached or hacked. Oh, and that's man. at wow. an all time high, right? Top three items on the board level, CIOs all over. They have no idea how to conquer it just because security has been underinvested. And then you look at number three is the, the changing role of the CIO. They're involved in almost everything. They're accountable for everything, but at the same time, they can't control anything. It's a very tough place to be in where you're, if you're keeping the lights on, doing a great job, then you get a reputation of, oh, this person's great, but he's just keeping the lights on. What about innovation? So now you have to balance the act of 
do a great job of keeping the lights on at the same time, transforming the institution all at the same time. So those are the three hot trends coming to healthcare. Everyone's focusing on how to be more efficient, how do they generate additional revenue. Um, give you one stat, the average revenue percentage wise for hospital system in the US is two to 3%. That's their margin. Wow. So how do you survive? So it's a very real thing and everyone's struggling to figure out how do they increase that margin or at minimum sustain the margin with the cuts that we're seeing from the financials. Um, reimbursements. Sure, sure. You know, I remember uh, when Ray told me that uh, you were joining Constellation, and I'm like, how did you nab one of the hottest rising healthcare CIOs in the world with all these institutions that wanted you to join them to run their IT organization, and you joined Constellation, which is amazing. But my question to you is, now that you're on the analyst side, because you had analysts that from the biggest firms in the world that, that were advising you when you were CIO, and now you're on the other side of the table. So you must have had some pre preconceived notion of what you should do in terms of an analyst when you started, and now you've been doing this for some time. What's changed in terms of how you approach a CIO where you've been in her shoe, you want her to be successful, and now you have this analyst who has practitioner expertise, award-winning practitioner expertise, and, 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 uh, and you're trying to give these folks the ability to influence and change the organization. What has changed? Yeah, the biggest thing I've learned from Ray as well is we, we have to call out the BS. There's a lot of nonsense that's going on, a lot of smoke, uh, smoky mirrors in terms of whether it's product or even ideas. So to be able to call those out and be able to tell the right story. You know, when, when you talk to executives, the key is you have to be able to tell that story in 30 to 45 seconds. You cannot go on for five to six minutes 30, 40 seconds, get to the point, frame it in a story format, and move on. Um, these executives are so busy. that So I've had to really craft my skill sets as far as storytelling, um, being able to hone that in the same way we do on Twitter. I think that's really uh, something that I have observed and really worked on. And then secondly, when you look at all these uh, various uh, solutions out there from an analyst perspective, you get bombarded and overwhelmed with solutions from everywhere. There are so many duplications. Now you have to really dig in extremely deep to figure out what is that differentiator. The good part is, I would say, given my background as a practitioner for 20 years, I could figure out what that differentiator is from solution A versus B. It's not that solution A is that much better than B, but you, once you understand the environment of the buyer's mentality, being able to fit that in. So that's been sort of, that's been my focus, and that's been what, that's what I have seen in terms of the top analysts uh, folks like Ray, that's uh, who has been able to deliver those type of messages. And uh, I'm still learning to this day, but that's been yeah. what I'm working on personally. So precision, relevance, um, uh, comparisons, contextual intelligence, so that you can really quickly provide value to, to your clients. That's, uh, that, that, those are lifelong skills that can benefit you in any role. So that's amazing. <laughs> I'm still learning. I don't know what's going on. No, <laughs> There's so I'm much. I'm waiting for Ray to get IBM Watson to replace me on Disrupt TV. So I, that's going to happen at some point. <laughs> you know, I, what I really wanted to ask uh, Dr. Bowen was really the uh, Tina was really the this thing that's weird. I can't figure it out. Like NLP, right? Natural language processing seems to be so much harder. Like at Facebook, typing stuff out, right? You know, doing transcripts. Then it comes to image recognition. Image recognition is like boom, boom, boom. It's like automatic. There are no humans involved, right? Yeah. It's kind yeah. of very interesting. I, I don't know what you're seeing there, Dave, but it, it's like, you know, you do pack systems. There's no human, right? These things are gone, massive precision. And then there's humans talking. It's like, oh, no, 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 no. It's NLP thing. Like, I can train this thing. Like, what? What is the difference? Yeah, the key difference there is the images are stagnant. Right, when you think about the radiology images, they're stagnant and it's very consistent. They're able to detect anomaly really, really well. But when you talk about languages, people interpret, people say things in a different manner. So we may be, we may be saying uh, the same context, but our delivery approach is different. Yeah. So that's going to take some time for a computer to pick up that differentiator. Uh, even when you look at, I'll use, I'll use Mandarin as an example, it's very yeah. hard for NLP to work in Mandarin because there are so many different ways to say um, the same things in, in a different context. So for a computer to pick that up, they may, may even be impossible. So I think that's where, that's where the NLP has the difficulty. We'll get there. I think with any NLP and AI solutions, you need to have time. 
time to perfect these algorithms. And that's what we're trying, starting to see, just like when Siri came out. You know, at the initial onset, it was not the greatest, but now it has improved so much where you trust it. I do foresee the same happening in healthcare where we are going to trust NLP even more. I've seen organizations come out with their new term, ambient clinical intelligence. It's all about how they're going to use this natural language processing to really determine and create that experience for the clinic. Isn't there some money jar like every time we use these terms like we have to pay someone ten dollars <laughs> let's go to the child fund the child kids uh, fund so please donate to that i got three kids we gotta go to college so that's awesome i'm with you i got three as well so, so you know we talk a lot about obviously modernization of existing process uh, processes leveraging technology but there's also a really exciting part of the equation which is new business model innovation can you talk about what business models you see evolving in healthcare? Because it seems like not, not only the consumerization of IT that really started when this device was launched in 2007, that consumer mindset may be, you know, reshaping, you know, the healthcare industry. So the model is definitely changing. The problem is the reimbursement and the incentives are not aligned yet. But we are moving towards care at the home. That is the next trend that's coming on. People want to be care in their home. They want to be in a convenient setting. Now, this is not surgery. This is not, not the complicated stuff. But the normal acute stuff, it's going to be happening in people's home. You know, the virtual care, telemedicine, those are all happening. But the incentives are not there. If you get reimbursed 30 to $40 for every visit, that's not enough to sustain a 2 to $5 billion organization. So what do you do there? And that, that's, the, that's, that's the struggle that the healthcare providers are, are facing these days. But that is the right approach. And it's very hard. It's a very tough call if I were the CEO for any institution. This is the toughest call you have to make right now because as we moved out this value-based care, population health management, where it's all about keeping the patients healthier and healthier, but you, you don't get paid and reimbursed for providing the same number of tests, what do you do? You're going to lose money. So how do you go to the board and say, you know, I'm doing the greatest job in terms of value-based care and population health management. That's going to set us up for the next three to five years. But in the next three years, I'm going to lose money. This guy's going to be fired or he or she's going to be out of a job. So that is what's happening in the healthcare industry where the reimbursement is not aligned. But everyone's focused on moving care to the home. They're utilizing technology. They're utilizing videos. Yeah. Now the next step that we need to take is getting the clinicians really trained as part of their practice. So think about going through medical school. No one's trained on using technology yet. Mm -hmm. We need to incorporate that into the education system so that they're learning to use these tools during medical school so that by the time they're practicing, they're already accustomed to it versus seeing for the first time when they get into the hospital. So I'm gonna make a statement, you tell me true or false. In 10 years or less, Amazon will disrupt the healthcare industry like Uber and Airbnb did with transportation and healthcare. False. The reason for that is they have to buy a hospital operations. You can't look at it from the outside. Why You're the greatest they, supply chain they, company. They go, why, why wouldn't they be able to do that? A trillion dollar market cap company who will invest ahead of profit and, 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 and to get to a point where they can completely disrupt industries. I mean. They could, but they have to. I think that that's the first move they need to take. They have to buy a hospital operations. It's very hard to look at from the outset. They could do a good job with pharmacy supplies because it's all supply chain. But when you get into the complexity of the hospital operations, and if you don't have that under your umbrella, it is very hard to do. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Hey, you recently built a whole bunch of uh, shortlists. So tell us a little bit about the coverage areas that you're in uh, and some of the shortlists. And now what was interesting about that process? Yeah, it's a big focus on security, right? There's, I, I think I mentioned earlier at the top of the show, security's on top three radar for the board and the CIOs. Mm -hmm. And most importantly, medical device security. Because now when you walk into the hospital, everything is smart, including your, your bed, your smart pumps, and so forth. But there's no way of tracking down, even just getting the right inventory. So now you're seeing a lot of these companies provide medical device security, and those are some of the criteria we looked at as far as the ease of use, how accurate is the inventory, and how easy is it to set up? Because when you look at putting these devices in a hospital infrastructure, can it integrate well with the existing environment? There's uh, a we also telemetry in the hospital, you're right. Like oh, every one of those yeah. devices, like sending something off, and, and you're, you're saying they're unsecure? Like I could just hop in and grab the information up on all these things? No. Some, I've seen an organization where I walked into where they never even changed the IP address. It was still 
at the default from the manufacturer. Wow. So there are a lot of those still floating around and you now there's times when they're just plugged in without the knowledge of the centralized IT. So there's just a lot of things going on in the hospital wow. operations. What's, an, what's another short list that's hot like, that, that's going on? I, I talked about the resurgence of the ERP, not the sexiest thing, but the back office transformation is hot. <laughs> it's worth, everyone's going to be buying in the next two or three years, but if they're making the right decisions, this piece can really enhance their customer experience. They can, like a, they can use it as a tool set for analytics because every ERP vendor is coming out with a playbook and a platform to do everything. It is not just accounting and finance and supply chain. They want to take over the entire suite. So the, the, the big question is, as a healthcare buyer and provider, are you going to partner with these giants to be your platform of choice? And that's what we're evaluating as well. So you put out like six or seven of these short lists to really help people figure out what they need to do or who to start with when they're thinking about healthcare. Where do we get access to the short list? How do we get access to it? They're, they're on the website. So we'll, we'll definitely republish those. Um, it's definitely on my Twitter feed as well. The Constellation Twitter feed definitely has those. So we'll make sure those are uh, out there even more. But something to think about in terms of what I, my role right now is when you think about the average portfolio of a CIO, they have between 600 to 1,000 applications. Mm -hmm. My job is to help them not make as many bad decisions as they make ever on a regular basis. That's the key. <laughs> sure, absolutely. Wow. So give us, some job, advice. Give, give some advice to CIOs who are looking to succeed in a healthcare environment. And, and how, how much has your advice changed today versus if I was asking you this question three years ago? No, I would say I have a lot of insights now that I did not have before. I, 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 you know, I get a lot of information under NDA, so therefore the, the recommendations are going to be a lot more, a lot deeper than where I probably wouldn't have those insights before. So for any successful CIO to, uh, to be successful, you know, one of my takeaways has always been understanding the business model. I would say my personal differentiator is between my peers is I've actually understand how to run a hospital. So that means I know how supply chain and hospital work. I understand how billing works down to the revenue cycle, all the way down to ICD-9 and nice ICD-10 codes. You know, I understand the billing codes. I understand how the clinical workflow. So it's important for the CIOs to really take that time, if they're able to, to do so, really understand each department. Um, luckily for me, I had that privilege early on where I had a mentor that allowed me to roam the hospital where I sat in every department for three to four months not doing anything IT really, even though it was hard to, to be in the IT department. I actually sat in every business department. So if you had that access or had that privilege, spend the time to do that because that is the difference. Technology is the actual easy part. Wow. That's wow. Tough. We're getting healthcare there no insights. IT, there are no IT projects. They're business no. projects. And if no you don't business. understand the business, you're not going to be able to tie back your IT investment thesis to outcomes. Wow. We're exactly. here with David Cho, VP and Principal Analyst at Constellation Research giving you interesting healthcare insights. You can check out his short list at the Constellation website under short list. More importantly, um, you can follow him on Twitter at DCHOU1107 for super insights into healthcare, healthcare tech, and what's next. Thanks, David. Thank you so Thanks, much. Thanks, guys. Terrific, terrific. One of the smartest CIOs I know, and Ray, what a great addition to Constellation. He's just- oh, We're so lucky to have him. We're so lucky to have him. Yeah, absolutely. So speaking of live here, coast to coast, <laughs> coast to coast on radio stations everywhere and on this Rob TV. If you can follow us on SoundCloud, iTunes, YouTube, and Vimeo. Who do we have on our guests for next week's show, episode number 162? I can't believe we're radio personalities. Um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no offense to anyone listening. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We have... Uh, uh, our first couple of guests, uh, Nikolai Sidklau and Christian Turwich, are authors of Connected Strategy, Building Continuous Customer Relationships for Competitive Advantage, so two, two authors. We have Sean Mandel. Sean was first on our guest as the Chief Digital Officer at, at TELUS, and now he's joining us as the Chief Digital Officer at Cineplex. So he's got a new role, and he's, again, an extraordinary CDO. We're going to learn a lot about uh, transformation uh, in the media entertainment industry. And our final guest will be Cindy Zhou, Chief Marketing Officer at Level Access, a repeat guest on our show. And she is one of the most talented CMOs that we've had on our show. So next week is going to be big brains, super interesting, and very dynamic, a CMO, a CDO, and two extraordinary storytellers on Disrupt TV. Ray, your closing, uh, closing thoughts. 
oh, I can't believe the fall is just beginning. Summer is almost over. We are sitting at Labor Day and you are headed off to do some really cool stuff. Where are you off to? Bob? I'm leaving tomorrow to spend a week in Australia. In fact, I'm coming back next Friday. So in case um, I'm not here, you're in good hands with Ray. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs> yeah. All right, wait. Well, hey, where are you, where are you Friday, uh, I'm, I'm going to be at Freshworks in Las Vegas. Uh, and of course, you know, We'll, we'll try to make the show. I think I should be okay. But if it's Friday, it's Disrupt TV. Please contact us at Disrupt TV Show on Twitter. And you can always reach us, follow at V A L A A F S H A R, and myself at R W A N G Zero. Thank you so much for listening in. Thanks, everyone. See you next week. Bye.